Let's go ahead and get started. We've got um, a lot of information. We're not only going to talk about mag locks and, and applications, but we're also going to bring in codes uh, and codes play a pretty big part in what we're going to do. So um, a lot of different things to think about as we continue on here. So let's go ahead. Um, also, boy, um, Katie, Russ, um, uh, Russ and I and Ruben, when he joins us, um, we're all out of the Phoenix facility of HES, Securitron, Alarm Controls, Adams Right Storefront Openings, Life Safety Power. Um, we get to have a lot of fun because to me, I get to take something from a mechanical format into an electrified format. And my background is 23 years on the fire security and access control side of the industry. I started at the bottom and, and I worked up into full management pretty much by the time I'd gotten about 15, oh, 14, 15 years in, in the more management roles. Um, so I've done sales, I've been sales manager, um, a lot of different things over the years. So, but uh, a lot of fun, but to me, when we're working with all these doors and components and everything, it's understanding them and it's the application side is what's exciting to me. Taking a look and understanding what needs to be done uh, is really critical. And with also what I get a great part of seeing the mechanical side and also the fun part of the electrical side and all these components that we have here. And, the great team that we have up here on top um, out of the Phoenix facility. And if you want classes on these, Adam's right, alarm controls, um, switches, storefront aluminum, we have classes. We're sitting right now, I think at around 25 or 26 unique one hour classes already created. And they're all free to watch on demand. Um, so feel free, to, um, you're gonna receive links to those um, uh, uh, sites as well later on from Katie. So. You know, if you have any questions on a lot of this stuff, you've got a lot of resources from Asa Bloy, and we have a lot of resources from our team here in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, we have all four of uh, the four major brands right here that we work with. So, warranty is obviously important to us. Um, keep in mind, my background is 23 years from the industry side of this. And, and I was fortunate enough that, you know, Securitron was up in uh, Reno, uh, outside of Reno, Nevada, and HES strikes were here, right here in Phoenix, Arizona. So I was able to get, you know, in the mid, or early to mid nineties, you know, get involved with um, HES and some of the strikes and the products that they have. And I think one of the biggest things to me is really when I look at buying something is the warranty and the backup that you get for the product. And that no fault warranty is, is really key to me because I know that I can take it back and, and get it exchanged fairly quickly. So Obviously, we're always going to see changes in uh, evolution in the warranty policy, but a lot of these, when we look at, you know, the warranty over here for mag Maglox, lifetime, no questions asked warranty, um, phenomenal warranty. And, and when you need to replace something and, and it's great, you know, a good product, you know where to go back to get the same product again. Safety is always critical. Um, I was a training manager for 140 technicians on the road. Um, so safety was critical to us and, and safety was something we talked about every single day. Um, we had formal trainings every single week, um, toolbox talks that we went through with safety. And, and I always told everybody, I want you to go home at night. I want everyone to go home safely in one piece at the end of the day. And, and safety has changed and evolved over the last year um, based on what we're dealing with right now. And it's going to change again. It's going to continue to change. But safety is I want everybody to go home at the end of the day. So training is important, making sure field supervisors, project managers, whoever they are, they're really pushing safety. Safety is critical to what we're gonna do. So let's kind of look at what we're gonna to do today. So we're gonna talk about mag locks and we're gonna talk a little bit about codes. We're gonna talk about some, uh, review some of the primary things that we need to know and understand about codes when it comes to mag locks because mag locks, other than delayed egress and other than controlled egress, mag locks are probably the most um, enforced code standards that we have across the United States when it comes to putting a mag lock on a door. And that jurisdictional stuff um, varies from city to city, from state to state. Um, so kind of the different things that, you know, we can't always talk about um, in this class, but things that we can help you with and assist you with. I love reading codes. Katie will always tell you I'm the code nerd. So within the scenarios today, we're going to have code questions. So here, a little bit of understanding. I'm gonna talk a little bit about codes and I'm gonna give you a reference point for codes too. Our presentations are fully downloadable. You can go back and you can download this presentation so you've got the reference numbers for future reference as well. So let's go back in history. You know, I, I love this song. I, I, I know Russ kind of took it out of his class on Tuesday, but I like this song. I'm an old spaghetti Western style guy, you know, but when we look at the history uh, of locks uh, that we've had, you know, electric strikes came out in, in the 18, uh, 1883 timeframes, mag locks came along in 1886. 
And over that time, we've seen some really, really bad stuff that's been out there, understanding how to put something on a frame, how to get it stayed up, um, permanently stay in place, maintenance and standards that are out there. These are things that we have to kind of pay attention to in our stand as we look at some of this stuff. So as we get into this, I'm going to kind of show you, I'm going to show you the real simple way of understanding this. I'm going to show you the codes and then we're going to get in and we're going to start talking about our different scenarios that we have. So when we think about a mag lock, for the best, for the most part, the standards of what you see on door number one right here, uh, if I want to put a mag lock on it, we think about a mag lock, a motion detector, a 30 second timer and tying it into the fire alarm panel. That has been around since the early 1990s. So it's been around for a long time. It's had very few changes that have actually happened in that base code of a mag lock from the 1990s. And by the late 1990s, we had the second way to put a mag lock on a door. And that's where we started going into using a piece of hardware, using a piece of hardware to release a mag lock on a door. Can we add a switch into a panel? Can we add a switch into a lever? Not easily, but if a lever comes, if an electrified lever comes with it, you know, where can I, is there, you know, where I can turn a lever and it can release a switch? There are different things that are available today. And most commonly is a bar, putting a bar across a door that will break power to a mag lock. That came along in the late 1990s for us on the West Coast. So if you're on the West Coast, we've been doing a bar to release a mag lock since the late 1990s and it came out of Denver. So Denver kind of gave us this option and it became very well adopted on the West Coast. It did not formally make it into the code book though until 2009 code series. But we've been doing it for many years before. Uh, and a lot of that is part of the Western cooperation you see between code officials, uh, fire department, building official inspection and the groups that shared a lot of information. But this guy here, been around since the late 1990s on the West Coast, very commonly accepted on the West Coast, did not make it into the code book until 2009. What we're gonna do is, here I'm going to show you the 2015 code series, and I'm going to show you 2015 for, for number one and for number two. And what I want you to really look at and keep in mind is that 2015 was, you know, we had some pretty mi you know, minor changes. I say oftentimes you think of codes changing and evolving, maybe five to 10% change in any given code cycle time frame. But for Maglocks, it really didn't change too much. But in, two, in 2015, we started looking more at groups, occupancies, where we could put a mag lock. So we changed. We said where we could not put it, and then we kind of said where we can put it. You know, so we started looking at occupancies, how a building is being used, and, and that becomes important to us as we're going to go through some of the scenarios we're going to talk about today. And, and I highlighted the box up here. So this is just the base code as it is. So this is 2015. 2018 is pretty much the same. Not a lot of changes that we run into um, with the 2018 code. We about you know, where, you know, where we're going to put a mag lock at. So we've got our different occupancy groups up here, and I'm going to show you those in a minute as well. So sensor release, you know, mag lock, motion, 30-second timer tied into the fire alarm panel. That's your base code right there. The next code we have, the second one here, is electromagnetically locked doors. That's where I've got a mag lock on the door, and I'm going to use some type of hardware to release it, some type of hardware that is an obvious method of operation. If I go to a door, and I need to go through that door and I have a lever on the handle, I'm gonna turn the lever and exit out the door. I'm gonna hit the bar, obvious methods of operation and also ADA compliant. But here again, up on the top, I still focus on my different occupancies where I can add a mag lock to it. So those are important things. And we're gonna run into a scenario here. We're gonna talk about that uh, as we continue forward. And if you're not familiar, when I get in and I teach, um, when I do my regular codes classes, I, I do this, I talk about, you know, how a building is being used and how a building is being occupied. And on the left-hand side over here, we have our major groupings, you know, from assembly, business, educational, factory. What are the different groups that we have? And the big red flag is right here, is right here in the red, the H, high hazard. So we're paying attention to the details as, as we look at some of these and we learn and understand these. And I always stress that even our salespeople should understand codes because a salesperson, if, if the salesperson is doing our site surveys for us, we're expecting the salesperson to gather information for us. Um, we obviously ask them to take a lot of pictures, a lot of images to help us out. They bring it back to the security engineer, all depending on how your organization is um, put together. 
and manpower you have available when you're designing different systems out there. But whoever's doing the site survey, you know, understanding basic codes for electronic locking a door is not that major of a lift. Um, I have a class, you know, we have a basic class that we can run through in about an hour. If I want to take that out, I can take that class out to four hours and get into a lot more detail. Um, but there are different ways to talk about in our standing codes, understanding how to do a site survey, and understanding what you're looking at when we start putting things together because codes play a big part in, in applications, and we have to understand that, you know, the role they play in it. We also have to have a good understanding about mag locks. Our, our focus today is going to be on mag locks and the different types of mag locks that we have. We have mag locks that are designed to be used indoors or outdoors. They're outdoor certified. They're sealed. They're potted. Um, they're designed to have that uh, weatherproof application outside. And a lot of these, you know, have input that comes actually from DOD, Department of Defense, because the DOD back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s were using mag locks to lock and secure things. But when you get that outdoor rating on something up on top of here, usually what you're looking at is, is a coating that's added onto the top of the mag lock here to help prevent rust and corrosion. And, and that's very important because we have to understand the difference between outdoor and indoor rated and, and what is the actual application. And I'm going to show the next one here is, is a good example. I found this one in Galveston, Texas. And while this was intended to be an indoor mag lock, it's mounted on the inside of a building. In Galveston, Texas, they have a lot of storms, a lot of heavy storm areas uh, coming in there. They have a lot of salt, a lot of moisture and humidity in the air. And, and this, you know, the mag lock, yeah, it may have been designed to be an interior mag lock and they put it on the perimeter door on the inside of the building. But here again, we have to kind of use a little bit of common sense and, and understand that, okay, think of the environment you're in. It, it's not just whether something's on the interior of the building or the exterior of the building, but think about the overall environment in which you're in here. And, this mag lock was a year old. It was just, um, just basically what had happened is they built a fire station. Um, the fire station was built because they had the money to build it. It was not occupied. A year later, they're going back into occupy it now. And we're taking a look at some of the hardware and everything. And it, you know, they had all kinds of issues. And a lot of it, you know, here again, we get into consider your environment. Um, uh, we had a gentleman, I, I believe it was Mark, it said he's from Orlando, Florida. Um, if you've never been to Orlando, Florida, it's probably one of the worst rainstorms I've ever been in in my life was in Orlando. And here again, that heavy moisture area, you know, I always consider what type of mag lock am I going to use? If I've got it on a perimeter of a building, that door is going to be opening, closing, a lot of exposure to moisture, um, the salt from the ocean, wherever we're at, there again, different considerations we're going to take. But we also have some, a lot of many other mag locks that are available. You know, what we use here in Arizona you know, is going to be different than what you're going to use, use in Orlando. You know, we have a very, you know, for the most part, we're dry, you know, 350 days out of our year, you know, so we don't have quite the, quite as many issues that we have, but we've got different mag locks that give you mounting brackets, make it simple and easy, a lot of different features that we can have on different types of mag locks. Here again, it's understanding what we're going to be working with. And as we work with all these different mag locks and the different options that come available, probably one of the other things that's important is, you know, I show here outdoor applications of mag locks and specialty mag locks that we're going to have <clears throat> in different environments. But the other thing I'm going to focus on right here is also bracketing and how important bracketing is as we're looking at creating that secure environment. One of the last things we ever want to do is to have a return, um, a return because there's issues or something. And we start putting mag locks up on doors and we had a 4,000 pound mag lock. Well, there's nothing else that exists out there for 4,000 pounds, but if I want to be able to get that holding strength, we're going to talk about how do I secure it? How do I hold it up there so it's going to stay? You know, different things that we're paying attention to in different applications here for mag lock use in, in the delayed egress application. Here again, different applications. But this guy right here, this is a free tool we have out there available. And Katie will post it up here in just a minute. Um, it is a, a sheet that we can use that a salesperson or someone going out and doing site surveys can look to understand what type of frame am I working with? What type of bracketing do I need? We know that historically that 70% of our technicians who go out there and do jobs and they're putting a mag lock on a door, 70% do not have the proper bracketing that we need. And imagine a tool like this, that's free. You carry it with you. If it gets, okay, I got to put a mag lock on this door. What type of bracketing do I need? I pull the sheet out. I understand the type of frame. What type of support do I need to get proper alignment for my mag lock and my strike? Because I've got hundreds and hundreds of pictures of ugly mag lock installs. 
and, and a lot of times it could be something that we can fix because of bracketing. So we're going to get moving here. We've got some stuff, like I said, I'm going to look for input um, because I like to ask questions. Um, I want to kind of get the input from the audience. Um, hopefully you will all feel free to join us. Um, whether you want to uh, join us in chat, um, if you want to do input, you know, chat's fine um, as we go through this. If you want to raise your hand, um, we, can, um, we can look at unmuting you and let you ask your question or give us input, um, especially when we get into the question phase, because I'm going to ask questions here late, coming up here in a little bit. So here I have a door. And this door is an interior door um, that's going to separate a business from a manufacturing side of a building. Um, this door is not an exit door at this time. So at this time, I'm looking at controlling the other side of this door. So I'm going to go through this door and into a manufacturing area. We know that the occupancy on this building here, I've got the B occupancy in the front of the building, and I've got an M manufacturing in the back side of the building. We know we're going to have to do plans and permits are going to be required. And one of the things the customer wants is the customer wants card in and card out. They want to be able to keep the door free flowing. Um, they want, they do not want to have to um, worry about a center mullion in here because they want to be able to move equipment in and out between the two sides of the building. So when we start looking at this, you know, we start at, you know, we understand the basic operation of, of the door and how it's going to work. Right now, they currently have one door that is pinned. They're using the center um, lever set right here to relax the other door to be able to go through the door. So that's their basic operation of how this is gonna work right now. So are there any code questions that I have to be concerned about right now with the configuration of, of this door as I'm looking at it? If you wanna populate in chat or if you wanna raise your hand and you wanna come up and talk, we can definitely look at um, a meeting. We've got a small group this morning. But, um, if you have thoughts either, you know, populate something in chat. Let me know, are there, are there code questions that we're concerned about here uh, as, as we go through? But take um, Anybody want to have, anybody have any kind of input that we're looking at here? One of the first questions that I oftentimes look at is card read in and card read out. Um, anybody have any thoughts on that before I uh, continue on here? Okay, so card read in, card read out. Uh, it, it's something I do get a question on um, quite a bit. Um, customers call up and say, hey, I want to do card in and card out. What are the codes and the standards that we have to work with here? Um, is this the only exit from the space? No, it is not. This is, this is an internal of, of a big building. Um, this is a, a pass through from business into a manufacturing side of an area. So I'm going to kind of throw some twists in at you here in just a little bit. So that we'll come back to that one, Ken, in just a little bit. But are there any questions or concerns about card in and card out? Anybody have any thoughts on this? So right now, we're going to kind of say this is not an exit, part of the exit program, uh, exiting or egress out of this building or facility. It's a pass through from one part of the building to another part of the building. Um, card in and card out is not a problem. The issue you're going to run into, though, with many code officials when, when you're working with a card in, card out is, you know, do I need to have a requirement for um, releasing of those in case of a fire alarm activation or a sprinkler system activation. And those are things that we're going to look at as, as we continue on with our discussion here. So when I look at this type of door here, I've got a double swing door that swings into the area. That other side of the door is my secure side of the door. So with that, let's go ahead and take a look at what are my different scenarios here. So I've come up with three different possible locking areas. And as I said earlier, um, the customer does not want to center mullion. So we start working way through our different options here. We've got option A, mag locks, motion detector, 30 second timer connection to the fire alarm panel. Uh, and all we also have our, our reverse mounted mag lock. Option B, okay, here I've got mag locks, a pair of single mag locks released by a bar. Looking at my headers and my brackets that need to be used to be able to do my proper mounting and the security of, of my mag locks up on the opening. And then my last option I have is I'm pretty much, I have a pretty strong feeling about mullions. I don't like doors being insecure. Um, Mag locks are something that are never going to go away, but I like to give a capability of, of always providing a secure option as well as a fail safe option. So what I'm going to do here, um, so I've got A, B, and C, and they match up with my questions that are sitting up here. And, and what I'm going to do here is we're going to load up your first poll. Let me get into my first poll here, and I'm going to launch off my first poll here. And if you want to, if you'll go ahead and let's go in, populate, and let's see what we kind of come up with for our, um, for our different questions. What are your, what do you think are going to be our best options? 
And keep in mind, the other side of the door is the secure side of the door. The other side of the door is the secure side of the door. Okay. We have our different options. Got a few out there. Good. Thank you for everybody. Now, so we're kind of getting pretty close at neck and neck. What are we going to look at for our different options? Okay. We got eight. Can we get a couple more? Can we get up to 10? Give us your thoughts. There's no wrong, you know, there's no wrong answer because we can all learn from this. And that's why I like to be able to, but we're going to talk about some of this as we break this down a little bit more. Okay. Let's go ahead. We're at a minute here. Okay, so we got 10 here. So let's go ahead and let's end this poll. Okay, so I'm going to share this back and let's take a look at, at the polling results that we have here. So right now, you know, we go back, we're, we go back and, and we look at our different options here. So everyone pretty much took out the option C. So we took, I'm going to hide that over. We, we took out the center mullion. We looked at option A and we looked at option B here. And, and, and keep in mind, here again, this is paying attention to the customer and what they want to be able to do. Option B in this one here, we've got our mag locks with our exit bars on the doors. Um, now keep in mind, at this point, this is not considered an exit door. This is an interior door. Um, so we want to pay attention, you know, there again, what are our options? That kind of makes it a little bit of difference as we consider part of an exit, that path of egress, as Ken had mentioned earlier, is it part of that path of egress? That's another consideration we have to know in our standard codes. Okay, so we've got option B, which we kind of won this one. So we've got B, but we also have A over here. So let me go back and, and I'm going to go ahead and end this poll and let's talk about it now. So I'm going to stop sharing here, get rid of that, and let's continue on here. I want to talk about this. And oftentimes what people, you know, one of the things they ask is when we did a scenario, can we look and break down some of the different skill sets and everything else that goes into it? So I kind of broke it down, skills, dollars, you know, what do I consider my best options and things I need to consider based on the conversation with the customer. But as we start looking at breakdowns, we look at the skill level of the technician. What are technicians capable of working with? What's, you know, what is their experience with installing certain types of hardware? That's where I go back to the skill set. What are they capable of? Many technicians will learn how to install an electric strike and how to install a mag lock. Those are the first things they learn how to do. So skill set, Simple, uh, simple complexity. You know, I know that a center mullion adding that in is something most uh, technicians do not have a skill set for. And we're going to talk about some of the other partners that we may need that will help us out. And we also look at dollars. You know, what is the customer? You know, we, we've all met with a customer. We've all talked to customer. We all know that there are frugal customers out there as well. So we start breaking it down. As I said, I'm a big fan of, of, this, of the removal of center mullion, but that creates an issue for the customer. The customer wants that other side of the, the door secure. Okay, so keep that in mind. Okay, so I'm gonna cross off that. My next one I'm gonna look at, my single mag locks. Here again, I go back to my conversation with the customer. And one of the things the customer said is, that other side of the door has to be secure, period. That's his concern, security on the other side of that door. If I put a pair of bars across that door that will release and let me into that area, I therefore have lost the security option that comes along with, uh, with that option that I have. So listening to the customer, it's gonna bring me down to, A is gonna be my best suggestion. And when we continue to look at this, you know, let's take a look at this here. And, and as we bring this up here, um, you do notice that this time I did populate in and I did put in the exit sign up here. So we're gonna continue with that a little bit, but. Right now, my best suggestion is the reversible mag lock. So here again, it's not only understanding, you know, the hardware I'm going to put on the door, but also mounting it, getting it mounting and secured with the proper application. Reverse mount mag lock. I want the security on the secure side of the door at all times. Um, time, um, time and time again, I hear again is, you know, somebody has bypassed the mag lock. They stuck something in there on the plate or something with gum. Um, they put a dime up there, stuck it to it with gum. They defeated the mag lock. There again, the purpose of having a mag lock on the secure side of the door is important to me and to the customer because they stress they want that side of the door secure, only authorized people are allowed to go beyond that door. So we start looking at this, all of a sudden you can see I populated up there the exit sign. So we do have an exit sign capability within this facility. So now we're gonna take it a little bit deeper and I wanna change what we're gonna look at here. So right now I've got you in a scenario of a B and an M. But what happens, I had that exit sign on the top of that door. 
And, and all of a sudden I change your occupancy load. I change the occupancy, how it's being used. I've gone from an M, which is a, a manufacturing into an H. You know, all of a sudden I have different changes and different things I have to consider with this. Anybody have any thoughts on this? Um, what we can look at, um, what kind of a red flag that we have with this? Anybody want, if any, anybody feel comfortable coming up and talking on chat? When we, we look at this, you know, I, when I change the occupancy from M to H, you know, I, I, there again, if I'm going to look at putting a mag lock on the door, all of a sudden that going from an M to an H is going to change how I need to look at this door and the fact that it is in a path of egress now. So as we look at this, here again, we have to know and understand the codes um, which apply to what we do. Earlier in the program, I showed you the codes that deal with putting a mag lock on a door and the occupancies where we can put a mag lock and H was not included within that occupancy. So there are a lot of things that we need to consider. And as I look at this and I, I consider, you know, what I can and can't do, card read in, card read out with a mag lock on a door, I have a major red flag here in the code because H is not even listed as someplace where I can put a mag lock up here. So we need to have a good base understanding uh, of our codes and where we're allowed to do things. I also am gonna have an issue now with card in and card out, considering the fact that this is an exit pathway. By code, I, in, a, in a path to egress, you cannot stop someone from exiting that door um, by having them card read first. They need to be able to go and hit that door and be able to free egress at all times. So that means I'm, I'm probably looking at a different issue here is where I may need, to may need to entirely replace that opening. May need to do a complete replacement of that opening. Uh, um, it, since it is a path of egress, I need to look at different ways to lock and secure that door, um, but also maintain that free egress capability. I may even go to the point where I'm gonna look at egressing something beyond that point or uh, securing something access control beyond that point, maybe securing off a different part of it. Um, this is going into a corridor, can I secure a different door that's not in the path of egress? A lot of different things that we kind of have, if we're gonna do access control, we have to know and understand what are we looking at and what are some of the different options that are out there. So knowing the codes, salespeople, whoever's doing the site survey, I expect you to have a lot of good base knowledge. If not, you're gonna take it back and rely on your engineer to be able to help you out with it. So let's go ahead and take a look at another one we've got right here. Um, here I've got another scenario. I've got an executive office building. Um, this is up on a, what, a floor within a building. Um, I have swing through doors on this currently right now. Um, the doors are locked and secured by bottom bolts at the bottom of it. Um, I've got T-grid ceiling up above, which is really kind of nice. So my site survey to me is really, really important to me what I'm gonna do here. So if I can, in chat, in chat, can I get some input on what do we think are some key tools that we need to take to the job site with us when I'm doing a site survey on this? What are some key tools, um, key things that I need to take, and what are key things that I'm gonna be looking for when, when I go do the job site on this? If you could put some thoughts in chat, I would greatly appreciate it. Tape measure, great, okay. What else? Okay, notepads, lat, oh, okay, very good. Very good, Robert, I like that. Okay, no pads, ladder, what else? Okay, knuckles, knocking on things, very good. Cameras, exactly. These are a lot of things that we're looking for when, when we're doing things that we wanna take with us and do our site survey. Gathering information is critical to what we're gonna be doing. And one of the most important things that I like here is, you know, right off top, um, Robert got the ladder. Um, that is critical. and. When we're looking at this, doing our site survey, you know, I know oftentimes a salesperson is never going to get up there and take a look at this. And if I, what I'm going to oftentimes do with this is I'm going to do a great site survey. I'm going to gather the information. And oftentimes I may bring back, um, and very rarely do I ever want to bring someone else out to the job site. So that just means I'm putting more time and more money into this before I've even gotten an um, opportunity to bid it or even get the job. So I'm careful on, on, on watching time of others I need out there. But Someone who's gonna be capable of getting up there above that ceiling, what am I looking for? What am I concerned about when I'm looking at up what's above that ceiling? Anybody put in chat, what are we looking for? What's my concern? The cap up there, great. Because we're looking at that header support up there. What is the capability of supporting whatever I'm gonna put up there? You know, is that a basic framing up there? Um, how strong is it? You know, what can I mount something to? The cap up there is critical. 
Um, and different types of construction are going to create different types of problems. If I've got cinder block or I've got uh, um, brick or something like that behind, I know I've got a steel lintel piece that's sitting up on top of that. I may have to deal with that, but I want to get up above the ceiling up here and figure out what they want to do. The big thing about this one here is the customer wants to be able to keep uh, maintain the capability of a swing through a door. Okay, so they want that capability of a swing through a door. So that's an option I need to make sure and give them. But what are the special type of tools do I need? What kind of tools do I need on the project are important as well. And oftentimes when I'm getting up above there, I need to get into the header. I need to secure an anchor to the header. What do I need for tools? So with this application here, I've got, I created up um, three different scenarios. I've got um, a set of mag locks. I know the customer wants to swing through a door, but I'm going to give them the option here. Give them an option here based on B. That's, let's say we're in Austin, Texas. If you go to Austin, Texas, they say, if you're going to put a mag lock on a door, you will put a exit bar across that door to release it. So depending on the type of lock that we're going to put across there. What about right here? Shear locks. If you've been in our classes before, we've talked about shear locks and the different issues that we have. So we've got options A, mag lock, motion, button, you know, mag lock, release by bars, and then we've got shear locks, motions, and button. Different options that we have available. But here again, we go back to what does the customer want? What is the customer looking for for operation? So with that, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go um, and we're going to launch off our next poll question here. Let me stop that one and let's get on to our next poll and let's launch this one off and let's see how we do. Okay, so if we can you got to take, take a quick look at this and see what our different options are going to be. Are we looking at Single mag locks hanging from the hanging from the uh, cap up on top there with motion timer mag locks with bars across the door and they're not pretty either. Um, if I've got to put that, we know that we're going to stop that door. Um, we're not going to get the swing through motion the customer wants. So there again, go back to what is the customer what is the customer looking for? Um, and there again, shear locks. Listening to the customer, we have to listen and understand the functionality of the customer as we work our way through the uh, through each scenario. Okay, so right off the bat, we got that shear lock that's taken off on here. So here again, how much of this depends on the skill set of your technicians? What are the skill sets of the technicians? We can give them different options. We're going to take it back to the customer. The customer is going to be based on, you know, how frugal the customer can be. What do they think the best functionality is that they want to receive on this? Okay, so, so we've got 10 people that have voted here. Let's go ahead and kind of take a quick look at this. And let's see where we ended up at. I'm going to share this back, and by far the share the share lock really kind of dominated in this. And here again, what we think might be their best options and what for long term is one thing. What we want to do for the functionality for the customer is another thing. But I'm going to talk about that as well when we talk later on. We'll get into a different scenario here. So share locks by far took it. Let's take a look at what we're seeing with this when we look at some of the other settings that we're doing with skill sets. You know, different skill sets for our technicians. You know, shear locks may or may not um, be a, a major pain. And a lot of that comes on mortising in capability, um, where you've got to mortise something into that top header cap. What is the skill set of our technician? What's going to be the labor to get wiring in and around a building? When I have to start adding in, going down the sides and going down the side walls, I've got to add in um, uh, cords for the door cord loops and everything. I'm getting into a little bit more labor intensive. Um, skill sets of our technicians are important. Cost is uh, important as we're looking at working on this. And, and oftentimes, um, the salesperson, I, I'm, when I have a salesperson go out and do a site survey for me, I want them to give me a budgetary time frame that they think it's going to take to do this. And the more experience they gather, the closer and closer they're going to get to what I consider a realistic time frame for work on the job site and it's all the considerations that go into it. We break it down. Well, we know the customer does not want uh, does not want to be able to use the single mag locks and the bars. They're just too ugly aesthetically. They're not appealing. Single mag locks, motion detector button tied in the fire alarm panel, a very common application. Realistically, my best options here are going to be between the, the, the two mag locks on the door, but there again, I'm not going to fulfill what the customer wants for functionality. Shear locks, there again, fit the need of, of the application. They fit the need for the customer's functionality. I'm really concerned about how I'm going to secure something at the top of the door. You know, here was a, um, an example that I actually have. Someone gave it to me was um, they had a two by six that was secured to the header up above and everything was anchored up to the top of um, to that for the mag lock to be able to get a uh, proper holding force. 
only way to do it based on the header. Here again, it's going to take sometimes a technician or someone with a little bit more detail than a salesperson to figure out how am I going to anchor up there and how do I get the proper mounting parts and pieces that go with it. And the other part I really want to look, I'll go back here sorry about that, is if we're going to have a swing through door, I, I'm not a big fan of them, as most of you know. And, and if we're going to have a swing through door, we want to make sure there is documentation in place that, you know, the customer, the maintenance people, the facility people who will potentially call me for service. If that door is can get even a quarter of an inch out of alignment, I'm going to have a problem with my mag lock, the shear locks, securing and mounting properly. So here again, proper documentation on when do you call me so that I come out there. You know, if you, I mean, this is something where you need to have a conversation, you want to have documentation. Whoever's got that right to call you maintenance facility person, they call the right person, they call the right company. Okay, so let's go to one a little bit more challenging here, a little bit different. So this is an application that was sent to me um, from a college. Um, I had a university send this to me and say, what do we do with this thing? They want to access control it. This building has a B occupancy. They've got a business on one side of it, and the other side is, is an assembly. Um, so it's a part of the university, and they wanted to access control this lobby area here. And you can see it's a through and through, you know, lobby area here. I've got a double set of glass doors on one side of it, double set of glass doors on the other side of it. So um, they wanted to access control these openings. Um, and this one here created a lot of different challenges. They had a lot of, um, I probably had six or seven different conversations with them talking about what ifs, what can we do for here, what can we do for there. What I wanted to be able to show here in the red box up here is you can see the seam. Here's where the seam comes down where the glass is connected. So we can see a glass connection right there. So we know that with that seam there, uh, it, it's silicone. I may have some possibilities of what I can do with it. Um, they want a card in and free egress out. Currently at the bottom of this door, they've got um, uh, bolts that are turned from the inside to properly secure this door, um, which are allowed to do based on the occupancy and, and arrangements they made with a local AHJ. These are not normally exit doors for after hours, but during business, when that occupancy for assembly is occupied, these doors have to be unlocked. We have to understand the codes and the code requirements that go with it. So when I started to break this down, I started understanding this. And, and this one here, I. I don't have a lot of options here. I really, you know, the two different options I really have here are mag locks on the door, motion, 30 second timer, uh, fire alarm keypad, and, and option B over here. So this is not going to be a question about which one we're going to pick. I want to go a little bit more in detail on this one here. Um, is to me, option B, not a very good option due to the fact of getting wires down and around the side of the door. Um, so it's different, you know, Definitely something I, I'm not going to consider at this point, but I'm going to more focus on, on A in the situation. So here's a little bit bigger uh, blowing outside of this here. And what I want to do now is I'm going to put this out to you um, out there in the field. Um, everyone sitting out there listening is give me some input. What are the things I need to be concerned about? What, if I'm going to put mag locks on this door, I'm going to put a mag lock in motion and a 30 second time on this. What are other things I need to consider? How am I going to do this installation? So if you can, in chat, start giving me some of, you know, what are your thoughts? What are things that we need to consider on this application here? In uh, so if you can, give me some thoughts in chat. What are things that we're considering? If I'm going to put a mag lock on this, and when we get done, I'll tell you what, what my recommendation was, what my final recommendation was. Any thoughts? Stability of the door and the frame, exactly. You know, we know that that's, the security of this whole glass frame and everything is very important. We want to consider that. Is it very, is it stable? How is it anchored? Um, is it a secure environment? Um, add top rail. Potentially we can add a top rail or a header up there. It's something we can mount the mag lock to. We also have glue kits, which are available. Good. Running wires and running cables to it. You know, and not only getting cable to it. And what you, what you can't see on the inside is it, it is um, a painted ceiling. It's a painted cement ceiling inside there. You can see they've got the canned lights on the inside of the lobby in there, but it is painted cement. So it's a cement ceiling. How do we get wires around? Very important. So let's be kind of pocket, start populating some of my thoughts. You know, if I'm going to run wires, you know, am I looking at having to have conduit? Am I looking at having to have some kind of a conduit? Aesthetics are always going to be important when we get into a facility like this. Wiring is critical. You know, we talk about wiring and what type of wiring we may use. 
some of the nice parts are, and when we came along in the late 1990s, um, we started working with a company called Windy City Wire, and we were able to customize some of the wiring that we had um, and, and actually using, um, get ordering customized wiring and coding, you know, what color did I want it to be? Did I want it to be a white? Um, different options that we had, you know, we're all, we're all kind of used to using banana cable out there, um, the yellow cable, but I don't necessarily want to be able to use, uh, use the yellow cable, especially if I'm going to try and run it in my seams um, up and down along where that glass is. So there are capabilities of customizing glass and, and the sheathing and what goes inside of our, our wiring and everything. How about the 30 second timer? What's my issue here? If I've got to put a 30 second timer here, what does the code say about that 30 second timer? Any concerns out there on the 30 second timer? What are the requirements for installation of that 30 second timer? I know I have to have it if I'm gonna go with a mo uh, mag lock motion, 30 second timer, but what am I gonna be concerned about in this application when it comes to that mag, uh, mounting up that 30 second timer? And it's, in the, it's a part of the code. Can anybody tell me in chat? Within five feet of the door. Exactly, thank you, Ken. So I've got to have that within five feet of the door. So these are measurements that are going to become important to me. You know, is my five feet on this wall over here or is that five feet going to be somewhere on that glass? Different things we need to consider when we're thinking about applications and codes for mag locks when we put them out there. You know, getting wire in and around it. It's not about selecting hardware, but selecting application. Here I, I'll prop, you know, do I look at putting a header up there for proper mounting? Um, I'm going to need a really good glue kit to be able to put a good header up there. So different options, getting wires to it, um, concealing wires to it, um, conduit, panduit, that everything that's gotta go with it. So lots of different considerations and motion detectors too. How are we gonna mount something up here? My final recommendation of this, they had an interior door, uh, another set of interior doors and leave these alone, do, the in, uh, do interior sets of doors if you need to be able to use them. Um, Last thing I know, they did not do anything. They, they, the expense became too, what they're looking at, the options were too great for it. Do we potentially go into a shear lock on the floor? I would not. Um, I, I am not going to cut open that floor. I, I'm not going to get in there, cut up, uh, go into a shear lock on the floor. Some applications that might work, but there again, you've got expenses. You've got a lot of the contractors and vendors to be concerned about when we get into doing shear locks on the bottom. Okay, so let's go ahead. I've got another one here again. Um, let's take a look at gates and our exterior gates. And what are some of the different considerations that we have? You know, you're going to have gates and posts that we're going to be dealing with that come in many different shapes and sizes. You know, we're gathering our information. We're looking at the post. You know, what size are we looking for? You know, are we looking for three to four inches are sometimes the best um, uh, to be able to mount a secure mag lock through there. What kind of post do we have? Um, I prefer a square post over a round post, but we can deal with both. A lot of it comes back down into strapping. Um, so many different considerations. What type of hardware? You know, we're going to break it down. You know, can I put a, do I need to put a mag lock on the opening? Exit devices, um, cylindrical lock sets. These are all options that we can consider when we're looking at doing something with the gate. You know, what's the existing hardware that's around here? gate security, meshing, you know, they've got partial meshing down around the bottom here. But if I'm gonna access control this, I'm gonna look at meshing, you know, for a good three feet on both sides of the opening in there. And maybe I even need a collar that's gonna sit around it on, on top of it. So different consideration. Um, but here, can I get in chat quickly? Based on working on gates and some of your experience working on gate, who are some of the partners that me, we may wanna have? So who are some of the different partners that we may want to partner with to be able to complete an access control on this gate? I'm doing the entire complex, and now they want me to do a gate. But I think about my access control technicians, eh, they're not going to be able to do some of this work. So who are some of the other people? Very good. Mark, um, welders, Stanley. Oh, I don't know if I call Stanley, but find somebody that can work on this stuff. Welders are important partners to have. Even sometimes locksmiths are important too, because you know, when I look at partners that I'm going to have, um, fabrication, um, people who can do some different fabrications, welding, people that do locksmithing. Um, my locksmith did welding and fabrication as well. So I had that all in one, uh, one nice clean pocket, which really helped me out. Machine shop for bracket fabrication, exactly. Uh, and even kind of plating. Sometimes you got to have that specialty high-end plating. Um, I had an apartment complex one time. They wanted real high-end plating on it. It's like, okay. Um, the good part was that we had a plating company and you know, we took our brackets down there. They did the plating for us in, two, in about two, three days. I had them all back again. 
um, but they know how to do it properly. They, they do the plating, they harden it, everything that needs to be done. Partners that come in key. And then more important than anything else is the bracketing. What type of bracketing, what kind of support do we have? We're getting out there on different types of gates. I'm a big fan of that spring lock out here, especially when it comes to vehicle gates. With vehicle gates, you get much more of an impact because you got a gate control that's pushing and forcing it closed, or you got somebody that's just going to swing it closed. Uh, call Ameristar. Okay, it's a different company. There again, finding the companies that can do it for you. But if I'm doing something that already exists, um, I, I don't want to lose that money. You know, if I have to work with a gate contractor, fine. I had three or four gate contractors that I worked with on a regular basis. You know, they wanted to do the gate. They didn't want to do the access control. So I was able to come in and do the access control. But if we do it properly, this mag lock here was replaced after over 20 years in the field um, for free. This was in an outdoor compound in Oklahoma, and it lasted for a long time. Um, the mag lock actually came back in. They dated it. I think the date was like 1998, and we replaced it, I think, in 2019. So here again, doing a proper site survey and gathering the information we need is critical. So I've got another one here. Let's quickly take a look at this one here. Um, here, oftentimes, it's not about access control. Access control is a component of what we're going to do with it. But when we're looking at some of these outdoor compounds, we get into and doing gates and th things around the field. Sometimes the, the work, everything else being done to get the access control to a point is bigger. You know, in this situation here, you know, I've got my mag lock. I've got a round post in here. I've got it properly secured. Mag lock is secured to the wall. But think about all the extra condo work that, that we look at getting, um, getting the wire to where we need it to be. Is that something that I pull in and I do myself? Um, we had an electrical company that we would, um, they, they give us a couple of their guys and they come in and they do all the conduit work that we needed for us. I wanna keep my guys to do the stuff that we focus on, let them do the stuff they work on. Um, but they came in and they did, you know, created that, that pathway we needed for access control. Um, there again, partners that we may have as we work with access control, electrical guys are good because they're good with pipe. Um, I was very fortunate enough. I had a sprinkler team too, and I had a couple of my sprinkler guys. They were used to working with sprinkler pipe, but they're also very good conduit guys as well. So if I needed them, I could grab them. And the other thing we're going to keep in mind is this guy right here, that Knox box. How important is the Knox box? What are the requirements per code to add a Knox box, especially when we're dealing with outside gates? One more quick one here. Okay, what I want you to do is, can anybody in chat, give me some quick thoughts. What are we considering when we're looking at vehicle gates out here? Anybody, any kind of notes or thoughts that we have um, when we're working with these vehicle gates? You know, uh, anybody, who are we considering? Who are our partners we may be working with? Um, different types, you know, what are considerations? We're talking about locks, conduit work, um, life safety codes and standards that we have to deal with. Any thoughts anybody wants to populate in the chat? A you know, pretty quiet group out there today. So based on time, I'm going to kind of kind of work my way through here and let's take a look at some of these other parts and pieces because when we're getting out there on gates here again, understanding what type of locks we're going to put on concrete company for bearing cable. Very good. And that's we'll talk briefly about that here in just a little bit as well. But how do I get the, you know, what about the wire and the cable getting it around there? All the bracketing that needs to be done, all the switches that we may need to put, working with outdoor applications, having proper covers that we may need. Wireless transmitters here again, having the relationship. If they've got an auto operator, they probably have a system in place. Can we integrate with it? How about a Knox box? Capability of being getting past that gate or the fence if we need to. And, and probably even bigger yet, and this is something where we have to know and understand the codes, is a system called Tomar. And, and if you're not familiar with the Tomar system, this is where um, many gates that are going to have the electronic gating system on them, they have a Tomar system in it, and that is... Um, for these guys here. This is for the fire department to be able to get access control into that gate or that fence if they need to be able to respond to emergency that. So it's critical. There again, critical components that we have to know in our stand per code if we're gonna work on access control. Salespeople, I want you to know in our stand this stuff. The better you get at knowing our stand this stuff, the less I need to send somebody out there to follow behind you. That project manager comes behind you or works with you, he costs money. But there are a lot of these other parts and pieces and I talk about these in my other classes, you know, um, the miscellaneous parts and pieces that we oftentimes include in our bids. When we're getting out there and working in certain environments, we need to keep in mind, what do I need? Something underground? I, I understand, Ken, you had um, a bearing cable. I, I'm a big fan of, if I'm going to put a cable in the ground, I'm actually going to put it in a conduit no matter what. I'm still going to put a direct burial in there because 
eventually that conduit is going to break. It's going to have, it's going to open up. You're going to get water inside there. So I'm going to use a rigid conduit and a direct burial cable in conjunction with it, especially tools I may need for drilling through, um, drilling through the, the header, um, steel headers up above many doors, drill bits, parts and pieces and brackets. The big thing is, is we have a lot of support for you. If you have questions, reach out to me. I love applications. Um, send me pictures and images. We can have a conversation about some of this stuff. But our Awesome Boy customer support app is here. Reach out to us. If you touch the app, within minutes, you're literally talking to somebody. And we're going to go hair over here, um, but we will stay on and answer any questions. So don't feel that we're not going to ask questions. So when we get done, we will stay on and ask any, uh, answer any questions. Reach out to us. Our tech support teams are available from 8 a.m. East Coast time to 5 p.m. Hawaii time. Support. And if you're not familiar with my 10 minute rule, if you're working with something awesome, Lloyd, if you can't figure it out in 10 minutes, use the app. The app is there to help and support you.